Okay, welcome to another fun, fun, fun lecture. Um, I think this is the seventh one. This is the cerebellum now. So, um, this is a lecture that is heavy in content. It's perfectly fine to watch it a few times, watch it in half speed the first time and times two the second time or whatever. Um, so, if we begin with a quick overview of the cerebellum. If you know nothing about the cerebellum, you need to be able to understand this page, okay? You need to be able to understand that the cerebellum can be divided by neuroanatomists and by neuroscientists. And these are the different ways in which they are divided. So, anatomically, you need to know about the vermis, the paravermis, the fissures, the anterior, the posterior lobe, and the flocculonodular lobe. So, the first pin here has dropped on this fissure here, this little gap. That is called the primary fissure. We have another fissure here that's not labelled, but I will now write on here, called the horizontal fissure, which sort of runs a little something like that. Okay? The posterolateral fissure is on the other side. So pause for a minute and tell me, are we looking at an anterior or a posterior view of the cerebellum? Well, the answer is we're looking at a, um, a posterior view of the cerebellum. Oops. We're looking at a posterior view of the cerebellum. Okay. The anterior view has the cerebellar peduncles, which we'll come to, but this is the posterior view. So two more things to know here. This pin has dropped on the vermis, which is made up of a couple of different lobules that we will not go into today, but are probably useful to know for the actual um, NUNC competition, and will be entirely useless for the rest of your life. <laughs> Arbitrary terms rarely used now. And then bilateral to this is the paravermal region here. And by the way, we will cover all those lobules in the more advanced second cerebellar lecture. So, the paravermis is here, and then here we have our vermis, okay? So, anterior lobe, posterior lobe, and floccular nodular lobe. The posterior lobe is everything below the primary fissure. If you're stuck, it's everything below the primary fissure. The anterior lobe is everything above the primary fissure. And that's important because they get different blood supplies. And we'll come to that. So strokes will affect these areas preferentially. So you need to know that. Let's flip the cerebellum over and look at an anterior perspective. The first thing that hits you are these weird sort of eyes here, don't they? Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> The weird thing that sort of hits you are these um, cerebellar peduncles. So this is how the cerebellum talks to the pons, the medulla, and the midbrain. And how the midbrain, pons, medulla, the spinal cord, and the cerebrum all talk to the cerebellum. The cerebellum hangs off of the brain stem by these structures here. But we don't care about that today. We still have the vermis. But... A few things you need to know here are that we now have this thing, the flocculonodular lobe. Flocculo, so we have a flocculus, and we have a nodule. Now, the nodule is this little bumpy thing here, and our flocculus, on the other hand, is this little thing here. I don't know why I've lapsed into sounding like some sort of um, cartoon villain. The flocculus is here. So, flocculonodular lobe is a vestigial lobe. It's a very old phylogenetic thing concerned with um, vestibular function. So, speaking of which, oh, there's your two pins. So, that one, the first one went into the flocculus, F. This one went into the L. Functionally, we classify this strip together. Um, so it's classified into the FNL, the flocculonodular lobe. So we've done our anterior lobe, we've done our posterior lobe, we've done the FNL, we've done the vermis and the paravermis, and we've covered a further 
fissure. So we have our three fissures. So cool. Bye bye. We're now to functional. So we have cerebro, vestibulo, and spinous cerebellum. And thank you, neuroscientists, for how logically you've named these, because it tells us at a glance what it does, what it's connected to, and it tells us at a glance sort of where we're going, right? So the function, basically, if you think about it. So the cerebrocerebellum is between the cerebral hemispheres. And the and the cerebellum. So if we make our brainstem like this, we have our primary motor cortex, we have our premotor cortex, frontal eye fields and all that jazz here. Um, and then we have our primary somatosensory cortex, and we have the posterior parietal lobule here, which is divided into the superior and inferior portions. So we have, if you remember, our supramarginal gyrus, our angular gyrus. So this is our accumulation of things here. Our cerebrocerebellum is the communication between the cerebellum and all of these structures. So these upper motor neurons coming to the pons and then running to talk there. So this will be involved in higher processing. It's one of the later things to evolve. Your vestibular cerebellum, on the other hand, you have four vestibular nuclei, two in the pons and two in the medulla. They they sort of straddle the pontomedullary junction um, in the lateral, posterolateral aspect of the medulla. Most of them communicate with the cerebellum and they will inform the cerebellum of vestibular functions. So balance and a bit of auditory stuff as well, actually. There's a bit of cochlea, but not really much that we're going to talk about today. The spinocerebellum, finally, is the flocculonodular lobe, right, as we've talked about. This is, um, oh no, it's not, sorry, <laughs> it's the, it's the vermis and the paravermis. This is the flocculonodular lobe, I'm so sorry, vermis and paravermis, and this is the rest. We will come to a lovely picture of this soon. But our spinocerebellum is all four spinocerebellar tracts. If you remember, we have spinocerebellar tracts and they communicate unconscious proprioception from the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles. Right, so the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles. Now let's leave this page because we've spent long enough on it. So, we're looking at a posterior view of the cerebellum here and we've got x-ray vision to see the flocculonodular lobe which you can only see anteriorly. But the cerebrocerebellum are these lateral hemispheres here, both anterior and posterior lobe. This is our cerebrocerebellum. Here's our vermis and here's our paravermis. And this forms a spine, a longitudinal looking spine. It's our spinocerebellum for the functions that we've said. And what's left is the flocculonodular lobe, which is the vestibulocerebellum. Okay, so that's enough vascular supply right well we have we're going to have a whole series of lectures on vascular supply but long story short vertebral arteries usually come off the subclavian and they run along the ventromedial um medulla they come together to form the basilar artery at the pontomedullary junction here and then run on this anterior basilar surface they get off the superior cerebellar artery, which supplies, what a surprise, the superior portion. So we have anterior and posterior lobes here, because here's that primary, oop, here's that primary fissure, right? Right here? That was worse. Here's our primary fissure. So we know that this, therefore, is the anterior lobe, and this is the posterior lobe. So the superior cerebellar artery, just before the posterior cerebral, comes off. Our superior cerebellar artery supplies this portion. Our aica, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, supplies this middle portion. And then pica grabs the rest. Let's look at this in more detail. So here's superior cerebellar grabbing the top. Aica doing a very small region. 
and then pica below it. So superior cerebellar up at the top. Aica is blue. Aica you can think of as being the middle cerebellar peduncle and the flocculonodular lobe, basically. And then pica grabs the rest, including the tonsils down here, the cerebellar tonsils. So if we look at an axial section of the top portion of the posterior cranial fossa, we can see the top of the cerebellum here. It's almost entirely superior cerebellar artery. But now we're at a midpoint, sort of like here, we have the front anterior inferior cerebellar and we have the back almost exclusively pica. The further down we drop, pica takes up even more responsibility. So that's the blood supply of the cerebellum. Now we come to the functional architecture of the cerebellum. So um, the best way to think of this is if we have our cerebellum, right? So if we have our cerebellum here, so here's our cerebellum and we're looking laterally. If I take a slice out of this cerebellum here and open up this sort of cube shaped structure, we can split the cerebellum histologically into four layers. So let's do that now. So if I draw this now for you, we'll split it into four layers. One, two, three, four. This fourth layer is white matter, and this is where the deep cerebellar nuclei sit. We're not going to talk much about that for now, because there are three layers that I'm really concerned about here. The molecular layer, the Purkinje layer, and the granular layer. And this is where all of the major cells come into play. So let's start with the protagonist of the cerebellum, a Purkinje cell. Its cell body or cell soma sits in the Purkinje layer. It has a long axon that comes out and goes out of the cerebellum. It is the major efferent supply from the cerebellum. Okay, so if something is coming out of the cerebellum, it's coming from Purkinje cells. It then sends its dendrites up to this molecular layer but it has a very wide dendritic arbor that is incredibly weird. It's only two dimensional. So you can only see it in sagittal cross sections. If you cut any other way, you can't see it because it's just 2D. Very strange. So that's the Purkinje cell. The next cell I want to talk about is a basket cell. Now the basket cells begin life in the molecular layer. This is where their cell bodies are and they have very short, stubby dendrites in this basket layer. But they send their axons down and hug the, uh, the cell body of the Purkinje layer. So guess what they do? It's quite straightforward. They regulate the cell body of the Purkinje cell. Because remember we said Purkinje is the major efferent, so it should be no surprise to you that we have a number of cells involved in regulating. So I'm drawing another cell here with stumpy dendrites and a little axon. So here's the axon and it's going to synapse with a dendrite. This is a basket cell. So this lives entirely in the molecular layer and also interacts. So we've done three cells already and they're all based around this efferent flow from the Purkinje layer. So. There are two more cells to do, and both have their cell bodies in the granular layer. So I'm going to draw one here, and I'm going to draw one, let's do it in this color, draw one here. Okay, so which one should we do first? Let's do the, um, hmm, let's do the granular cells. So the granular cells we will do in green. I think, and the granular cells send their axon up here. So this process here parallels the top, which we call the fovea. And then we'll have a communication like so. Contrastingly, this cell will have a communication and a few more communications, but it has a beautiful 3D dendritic arbor up here. 
So note, this sends its dendrites up here. This sends its axon up here. So they're sort of inverted even though they're sat together. So that can be a bit annoying because then you've got to think if this is an axon, then this has to be a dendrite. And this has to be an axon, right? So axon, dendrite. So this cell's dendrite talks to this cell's axon. So don't get them mixed up, okay? So we have a granule cell and we have this cell, which is a Golgi type 2 cell. And these two talk to granular cells and Purkinje cells and stellate cells in the molecular layer up here. So those are the major cells. And then I just want you to know about two major afferent cells that come in. And they come in, um, well, we won't draw those. I'll just mention them here. So two major afferent cells, climbing fibers and mossy fibers. Your mossy fibers talk directly to the um, the granular cell and to the Golgi type 2 cells. Okay, so here's your Golgi cell, here's your granular cell. The three of them come together and talk at a point. This is called, like the kidney, a glomerulus, and it actually has neuroglia sitting around it to secure it in place because the glomerulus of the granular layer between a granular cell, a Golgi cell, and a mossy fiber represents some of the most important processing subunits of the cerebellum. So it's very well protected. The other one is a climbing fiber, which climbs all the way like moss. No, okay, let's not say that, like ivy. Climbs all the way to the Purkinje cells um, dendrites and wraps itself around them intimately. So let's do a quick summary before we take a quick break because that's a lot of information to take in. So our Purkinje cells, Purkinje protagonists with 2D sagittal arbor only, as we said. So the dendrites are only in the sagittal plane that we can see. So this, if you cut it sagittally, which is this sagittal plane as opposed to this coronal plane, you can only see the Purkinje cells in that plane. The physiology is that it uses the two major inputs and the only efferent ever, as we said. Granular, anatomy, dendrites and soma live in the granular layer. Whoops. So the dendrites and the soma live in the granular layer, projects the axon along here, and this parallel fibre follows the folia at the top here to talk to Purkinje cells. And that's its physiology. So... Our stellate cells, also called starry cells, because that's what stellate means, all sit, its axon, its dendrites, its soma, all sit in this molecular layer. So they're all confined there. And it further, it further modulates that dendritic arbor with the granular cells. Golgi type 2 have their axon and their soma in the granular layer, and their arbor is characteristically 3D. Okay, so it has a 3 I mean, this is a rubbish Golgi, but it has a beautiful 3D arbor. And it's involved in the modulation of granular cells, as we said. Basket cells are the ones that hug the Purkinje um, soma here. So we have dendrites. It, it's soma and dendrites live in the molecular layer, and it comes down to the Purkinje layer to regulate the soma directly. And it's an inhibitory layer. So we've covered all of that histology. We'll take a break, um, and here is a quick summary of those different layers. What I will draw your attention to is that these should be inverted. So the um, so this should be blue, and this should be brown. I don't have a brown, so we can say that this is our granular cell, and this is our Golgi cell. So have a go at writing that out from memory now. See if you can actively recall them. Give yourself the names of them and see if you can work out where they are. So we have two in the molecular layer, one in the Purkinje layer, two in the granular layer, and then two ascending. Right, deep cerebellar nuclei. So we've already alluded to these before. We have three different sections of deep cerebellar nuclei. Dentate, interposed, and vestigial. Your interposed is comprised of two globos and embelliform. 
So we have a globose and umbelliform nuclei. Now, the way that they supply things is really straightforward. The dentate nucleus supplies the lateral hemispheres, right? The vestigial nucleus supplies the flocculonodular lobe, and the interposed basically supplies the rest. So, our dentate nucleus supplies the lateral hemispheres, that's cerebrocerebellum. The interposed nucleus supplies the paravermal region here, and the vestigial nucleus supplies the nodule and the vermis. So these two are involved in the vestibulocerebellum and the spinocerebellum, whereas the dentate is just concerned with the cerebrocerebellum. So just to summarize this a little bit more, we can say that the dentate nucleus is basically the cerebrocerebellum. It uses the superior and middle cerebellar peduncles to connect to M2, the supplementary motor area and the premotor area. The interposed nucleus is basically spinocerebellum and uses the inferior cerebellar peduncle to connect to M1 and the cranial nerve nuclei. So it's directly influencing upper and lower motor neuron regulation, which you'd expect from the spinocerebellar tract. Your vestigial is vestibular cerebellar, which uses the inferior cerebellar peduncles to go to the four vestibular nuclei. Some say it goes to two of them, some say it goes to four of them. Who cares? It goes to vestibular nuclei, right? So, this is where I would probably advise you to take a break. We're over halfway now, um, but we're going to go through some tracts, which could take a bit of time. So, maybe take a pause here. Moving on. So we have the um, four different tracts, which we can divide into different sections based on their function. So the dorsal and cuneocerebellar tracts convey fine detail of subconscious movement, whereas your rostral and ventral spinocerebellar tracts are coarse details. The fine details come from the spindles and the coarse come from the Golgi tendon organs. Half of them supply the upper limb, half of them supply the lower limb. And the arbitrary level that we have for that is C8. So if the fibres are coming from below C8, we say it's lower limb. Above C8, we say it's the upper limb. Okay? So... A very brief overview. This is block three, so you should know this. So the cuneocerebellar tract comes in with its primary afferent neuron. There's a dorsal root ganglia. It comes in at the posterior horn through the, from the, from the, through the roots and the rootlets and then runs in the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the cuneate fasciculus up to the medulla, where the cuneate nucleus is. But it doesn't synapse at the cuneate nucleus, it synapses just next door to it at a little patch called the accessory cuneate nucleus, where the second order neurons form and out it goes. The dorsal spinocerebellar tract comes in and it ascends up here to go to the, um, uh, the cerebellum as well. But you need to draw your attention to this, which is Clark's column between L3 and C7. You will, so you ascend up to Clark's column, up through Clark's column before synapsing. So if you're below these levels, then you need to use Clark's column to ascend up before you become the second order neuron. So you won't just synapse at the level, but everything rostral to that L3, you will. So whew, the rostral and ventral spinocerebellar tracts now. Again, this is quite straightforward. Primary afferent neuron comes in and it stays ipsilateral. But the other spinocerebellar tract comes in, decussates at the anterior white commissure, and then runs up the contralateral side and then it comes in again. So it has double crossed to be ipsilateral. Bit of a faff, but the basis of a lot of questions to confuse students. OK, so just remember functionally the receptor subtypes, the level, fine versus coarse detail. So 
Whew. Corticopontocerebellar pathway. Sounds like a mouthful, but it's nice and easy. It really is. So we use our motor cortices up here and we project contralaterally to the cerebellum. Okay, that's all you need to know. The corticofugal pathway is a trilaminar thing. So corticobulbar, which goes to the um, cranial nerve nuclei, the lower ones. Corticospinal, which goes to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, the cell somas anyway. And corticopontine, which go to the front of the pons, and then the pons has horizontal fibres that go in through the um, MCP to the uh, nuclei, the deep cerebellum nuclei. And that's what it is. What about the fourth ventricle? Right, the fourth ventricle comes up a lot in questions. Here's our midbrain, pons and medulla, corpora quadrigemina, and here is our cerebellum. The dark pink is cortex, and everything else is the white matter that we talked about. So, the roof of the fourth ventricle is the cerebellum, here. The floor is the midbrain, the pons, the medulla. Mostly the pons and the medulla. Okay? And that's just worth remembering to orient yourself. Familiarise yourself with the ventricular system and how things flow um, in and how they flow out. We're not going to cover that now because I think you'll admit there's enough in this one lecture. <laughs> so here are some structures and we're going to go clockwise like this. So the first structure here is our third ventricle. The next structure here, this is our pineal gland of the epithalamus, if you remember. And then the next structure here is the superior colliculus. Next, we have the thalamus. This is the thalamus. And hanging off the thalamus is the metathalamus here, are our lateral geniculate nucleus and our medial geniculate nucleus. Lateral is vision, medial is auditory. We have our cerebral peduncle of the midbrain there. And then this little one, the only cranial nerve to emerge posteriorly is the trochlear nerve. And that's now going to run anteriorly. And then we have our inferior colliculus. And the habenula trigone with the stria medullaris to finish off the, um, the three parts of our epithalamus. So remember your epithalamus, your thalamus, your subthalamus, your, um, your thalamus itself. Remember all those different um, constituents. So where are we going first of all? Oh, right, so here's our SCP. So what's this structure here? Have a think. It's our MCP. So our superior cerebellar peduncle, our middle cerebellar peduncle, our inferior cerebellar peduncle. You now know what those are. Go back to the lecture to familiarise yourself, but this is what they look like. Superior, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. This little thing here is called our superior medullary vellum, and it forms the top of this rhomboid fossa that is the fourth ventricle. The base here is the obex, which we'll come to. Now next, we've opened the cerebellum and we've turned it laterally, and we can see in the white matter this little, this little um, serrated structure. This is the dentate nucleus of the deep cerebellar nuclei that we've mentioned before. This is the medullary stria, not to be confused with the stria medullaris. This is the medullary stria, which divides this rhomboid fossa into a superior and an inferior portion, which um, neurosurgeons sometimes use because medulloblastomas, common tumours, particularly in kids, occur in this region. So if it's supra or infra um, to the medullary stria. We have the obex here. And then we have these tubercles, the gracile tubercle and the cuneate tubercle, which is where the nuclei are for the dorsal column medial lamiscus system, where those second order neurons are formed. And then the last thing down here is a posterior median sulcus, which goes all the way down here. And let's finish off this exhaustive list. Um, by having the medial eminence, so we have a medial eminence, we have a lateral eminence, so we have a median sulcus and a medial sulcus. This median eminence has seventh nerve, so this, this is a bulge where seventh nerve is, the, um, the facial colliculus. The nerve runs out behind 
before it comes out anteriorly, if you remember. Here, we have our locus ceruleus, which are those noradrenergic projections, if you remember, for attention and vigilance. We have our inferior cerebellar peduncles. This is the lateral eminence altogether, and its superior aspect is the locus ceruleus. We also have two more cranial nerves in this inferior portion of the rhomboid fossa. We have the hypoglossal trigone, and we have the vagal trigone. So these are just bumps where their nuclei are. And then this region here is called the area postrema. So this is the very bottom of the rhomboid fossa, just um, superior to the obex, which is here. That's where your vomit center is. So you compress the area postrema, your tonsils, your cerebellar tonsils are here. If you have a herniation and pressure is pushing the cerebellum down, it will hit the area postrema, patient projectile vomits. So, manifestation of cerebellar disease, we use the mnemonic Danish. Mm, Danish pastries, hello. So Danish, um, see if you can remember it. We have dysmetria, ataxia, nystagmus, intention tremor, steds, slurred staccato speech, like me at this point, and hypotonia and the heel shin test. So dysmetria is overshoot or undershoot of a range of motion. So it's past finger pointing, right? Ataxia. You can also have dysdiodocokinesia in that as well, um, which is wet fish, floppy wet fish on the exam. <laughs> Ataxia, Romberg sign, because we require three modalities for Romberg sign to work fully effectively. But if we start to lose them, then the patient will sway. Nystagmus, a downbeat nystagmus is very common from flocular nodular lobe deficits. The intention tremor is due to a defect in the cerebrocerebellar pathway. Slurred staccato speech is this very well recognized pathway that we're going to talk about on the next slide, so I'm going to leave that for now. Um, and then we have hypotonia and heel shin, and this is due to a reduction of those spindle regulation from the dorsal and cuneocerebellar tract. That's what they think it is. So, slurred staccato speech. This fiber system originates in the um, in the dentate nucleus, then goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle. That shouldn't be news for you. But this should tell you that it's cerebrocerebellum, so it's going to be going up, isn't it? So it goes to the contralateral red nucleus, gives off collaterals to the superior colliculus, goes to the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus, and then to M2. So this is the region that's implicated in slurred staccato speech, which is called dysarthria, right? This is the dento dentato rubrothalamic tract. So we start with our dentate nucleus. We go through the superior cerebellar peduncle. We give off, and this is contralateral now, so we give off collaterals to the red nucleus, to the tegmental nuclei, but don't worry about that. And then from here, we have the thalamic tract to the ventrolateral, going to areas including four and six, but loads of others it will go to. So the very last point is the difference between dysarthria and dysphagia. So it's an issue with the articulation of speech that is linguistically normal. So in a dysphasic, they don't know the language. So it's language receptability or language expression. Their language is fine, but they can't articulate it to you. There's no deficiency in the receptor expressive structure neurologically. Rather, the sounds are not pieced or articulated like bones together. That's the difference. That's why you slur your speech when you're drunk, because alcohol preferentially affects the deep cerebellar nuclei, dentate nucleus. So the dentato rubrothalamic pathway is inhibited. Whew. Well, we've earned um, some wine, I think. There you go. That's the cerebellum. Thank you very much.